Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. Welcome to Concord Matters this week. I am your host, Pastor Joshua Shear, a pastor at Our Savior Lutheran Church here in Cheyenne, Wyoming, coming to you remotely from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, Concord Matters is a show where we go through the Book of Concord. Uh, great thing, read through it, comment about it, uh, learn about this faith that is ours, that has been handed down to us from Christ and the Apostles himself, all the way down and, of course, confessed in the Book of Concord. All right, so let's uh, let's go through, and we'll first introduce you to our two guests today. First guest is right here, right next to me, uh, as as he always is. He's uh, Pastor Marcus Bakey, um, the associate pastor here at our Savior Lutheran Church. Uh, welcome, Pastor Bakey. Thank you. Good to be back on the program. All right, and then a first-time guest for the show, uh, Pastor Adam Kuntz, who's a senior pastor of or, or pastor of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Lidditz, uh, Pennsylvania, and then also pastor at Concordia Lutheran Mission in Anvil, Pennsylvania. Uh, pastor Coons, welcome. Hey, good to be with you. All right, glad to have both of you with us. Uh, we are a call-in show, so uh, if you have a question or something, feel free to call in. Uh, you have a toll-free number, 800-730-2727. Otherwise, it's 314-821-0850, and we will try to address your questions on air today as we're going through the Book of Concord. For the Book of Concord, we use the Concordia Reader's Edition of the Book of Concord. Uh, it's available from, available from Concordia Publishing House. They run sales on it every so often. Great resource to have. If you're a, if you're a Lutheran, you should have one, and you should be reading it because this is what we believe, this is a great comfort to us, and this is what we confess before the world all around us. All right, so we are covering the apology of the Augsburg Confession, again, this defense of our faith over and against the criticisms of the Roman Catholics of 1530s uh, that, that heard the Augsburg Confession and then raised issue with it. We are in section uh, 5, according to the way the Concordia Reader's Edition numbers things. Uh, there's a little confusion here in the Apology always. Uh, other versions of the, of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession continue the numbering from the fourth article. So you'll hear me refer today to, we're going to start in paragraph 29, but in the old versions, it would be paragraph 150. So, uh, but I want to start out because this is a section that is all dealing with, and didn't cover all of it last time, last week. Um, so we're going to cover here, paragraph 26 starts it out with what we're talking about here. Someone may say, since we also confess that love is a work of the Holy Spirit, and since it is righteousness, because it is the fulfilling of the law, why do we not teach that love justifies? All right, and then they go on to talk about how uh, that you're going to have four different reasons through this whole section of why we don't just talk about uh, that love justifies. Why don't we teach that? Because, of course, we're going to talk about how love is the product of being justified. That is, it is a fruit of being justified by faith alone. And so, in paragraph 28, right before we pick up in 29, it does a great job of saying, you know, if anyone doubts whether sins are forgiven him, he dishonors Christ. And so, doubt to the enemy of faith. And so, faith here, we are going to be concerned with making sure that Christ gets the honor and the glory. And throughout this whole section today, you're going to see different things that relate to, you know, the more you take away from faith, the more you take away from Christ. And so if you want love to be it, if you want fulfilling of the law to be it, if you want other virtues to be it, all of those things are going to be robbing from Jesus that which Jesus himself has done. So this is the Lutheran concern. We want all glory to go to God for salvation, as the scriptures teach. And then, of course, we want then God to be praised through the fruits that he brings through us through his Holy Spirit, uh, that is, works of love and works of the law and virtues and so forth. So, like I said, last week we left off in paragraph 29. So we'll just pick up right there. Uh, paragraph 29, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. We'll just kind of read through 29 and, and 30 here. 
And uh, then we'll pick up with the 31 after a little bit of commentary on this. So here's paragraph 29. If anyone thinks that he receives forgiveness of sins because he loves, he dishonors Christ and will discover in God's judgment that this confidence in his own righteousness is wicked and useless. Likewise, it is necessary that faith alone reconciles and justifies. We do not receive forgiveness of sins through, the, through other powers of the law or because of these, patience, chastity, obedience, toward magistrates, and so on. Nevertheless, these virtues ought to follow faith. Likewise, we do not receive forgiveness of sins because of love for God, even though this must follow. All right. So, Pastor Bakey here, we'll start out with you giving some comments on this. This whole section, you know, the relationship between faith, good works, and then the glory of God, or the honor, as they say here, you know, dishonoring and honoring and so forth. How, how do they all interrelate? Yeah, you find this as one of the overriding concerns, not just in the apology of the Augsburg Confession, but the Augsburg Confession itself, and, and really throughout the the Book of Concord, the, the glory or the honor of Christ. And as you mentioned before, um, faith and, and to attribute our justification to faith alone is to give all glory and honor to Christ and to take away even just a, a percent from that is to diminish Christ. And, and again, you find that throughout the, the Augsburg Confession. And, uh, and so in 49, and, and even back to 40, um, excuse me, uh, 29 and 30, I'm using the old version here, so I might get a little confused on my paragraph numbers. Um, uh, in 29 and, and 30, you, you find the, the two poles of, uh, there that... Um, either pride or despair. And so in 29, there's pride. If you think you receive the forgiveness of sins because of your love, uh, because of your works, if you have pride in your ability to earn for yourself forgiveness, you are bringing Christ dishonor. Uh, whereas when you humble yourself, when you repent of your sins, when you acknowledge that you are saved by grace alone through faith alone, then Christ receives all glory and honor. And then moving forward, we see that uh, that this necessarily results in love. Exactly, and this is and this is the relationship they have to one another. And and so, Pastor Coons, it says here, you know that. That you dis, if, if you if you're trusting in anything other than Christ, that is, if if your trust is directed to your works, whether they be of love or of certain virtues, like they use patience, chastity, obedience towards magistrates, and so forth as examples, uh, he dishonors Christ, and his, his righteousness is wicked and useless. I mean, can you show us from the commandments how this is true? Because I mean, we're gonna if we're gonna convict each other of sins, let's let's show the how to use the commandments to do it. So, so Pastor Coons, could you could you use the commandments in this to show how when we trust other things, including the fulfilling of the commandments by ourselves, yeah. how we dishonor Christ and and find ourselves as wicked and 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 useless? Yeah. So this would be like somebody who believes that he keeps the commandments, um, maybe all of them. Um, sometimes, if he's a total unbeliever in any particular God, maybe he believes he keeps the second table of the law. But um, the one who tries to keep the commandments apart from the first commandment, which is the the fountain, the source of all the other ones, the one who tries to keep the commandments apart from trust in the Lord um, and trust in Christ and what he has done, uh, dishonors Christ by saying that he doesn't really need him because he could theoretically keep these things apart from him. Um, and even in the confutation of the Augsburg Confession, talking about this article, um, the Roman Catholic confessors said that, you know, well, you know, we're not Pelagians. We don't believe we can keep the commandments on our own. Okay, great. That's good. But then they said that, you know, um, we do, we do accumulate merits. And it's that very insistence on some human contribution to salvation, some human, uh, merit in displaying virtues, uh, fulfilling the law that Melanchthon is denying to them. He's saying that if you want to have a God who needs you to save you, then you don't have the true God. What did Christ do all of this for? Um, why is he who he is if somehow your fulfillment of the law were for your salvation? 
So the one who is trying to use the commandments as his ladder instead of Christ's grace as his ladder to heaven, so to speak, uh, dishonors Christ. And he's also going to just find a rude awakening at the last day. And I, I love that that, that point, um, and Melanchthon will come back to the terrified heart and the terrified conscience throughout this article in particular, to say that you really don't know what you're talking about if you're trying to tell me that I can be saved uh, through what I do and through the love that I display. You simply don't have a sufficient grasp of what sin has done to mankind and therefore what the remedy has to be, which is Christ. Excellent. And in fact, yeah, I mean, that's just kind of how this unfolds in Scripture. I mean, this is what the minor prophets and the, and the prophets spoke against all the time, was this trust in works and how the last day was going to be a day of surprise and shock for them. Yeah. And even Christ speaks this way about the end, that for for these, you know, Pharisees and stuff who have thought themselves so upright, uh, upright and upstanding and so forth, that it was going to be a day of, of weeping and, and gnashing of teeth. Right. And uh, it just, yeah, that this is uh, this is so basic. And of course, this is confessing against the Roman Catholic doctrine, which says, you know, faith, but faith perfected by love. Uh, they have to add their love into it. Uh, they have to have some works. So maybe not 100% us, but by golly, we're going to have something uh, for us to do. I think... I think it also concerns, um, and you, you see this if you read both the Confutation, which is in a whole separate volume, but just if you read through the, the Apology all at once, you see that their discussion of worship is just fundamentally different. The Roman Catholics are very concerned about the need to keep every tradition, um, the need to hold on to everything, and for it to be uniform everywhere. And Melanchthon is saying, since you don't understand what faith is, you can't truly worship God. And you're dishon whatever else whatever other honor you think you're doing to Christ and his saints, you're dishonoring him by teaching what you teach about justification. So you need to get this straight first, and then the rest of it falls into line as it does, as you see in the later articles of both the Confession and the Apology. But the chief thing is that Christ be honored uh, through proclamation of the gospel purely and solely. And to get that wrong is to get everything wrong. And that, that's just something I think their opponents did not quite understand about the Lutherans, what they were saying. Because... They didn't understand what the Lutherans were so concerned about faith and the honor of Christ. Exactly. All right, so let's move into paragraph 32 and following, or 30, uh, 31 and following. Um, I'm going to go 31 through 34, so a little longer section here, because it's primarily doing, dealing with the same text. Uh, and it will end with exactly what you talked about, Pastor Kuntz, that uh, uh, this faith in Christ, uh, looking for him for the forgiveness of sins, is true worship. And so... Uh, let's let's start with this, paragraph 31 through 34. Besides, this way of speaking is well known. At times we use a word for something, we, and we use that same word for the cause and effects of that thing. Synecdoche. Um, for example, in Luke 7, 47, Christ says, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Christ himself interprets this when he adds, Your faith has saved you. Christ did not mean that the woman had merited forgiveness of sins by that work of love. That is why he adds, your faith has saved you. But faith is that which freely obtains God's mercy because of God's word. If anyone denies that this is faith, he does not understand at all what faith is. The story in this passage shows what Christ calls love. The woman came with the opinion that forgiveness of sins should be sought in Christ. This worship is the highest worship of Christ. She could think nothing greater about Christ. To seek forgiveness of sins from him was truly to acknowledge the Messiah. To think of Christ this way, to worship him this way, to embrace him this way, is truly to believe. Furthermore, Christ used the word love not toward the woman, but against the Pharisee. He contrasted the entire worship of the Pharisee with the entire worship offered by the woman. He rebuked the Pharisee because he did not acknowledge that he was the Messiah, even though he performed the outward duties that a guest and a great and holy man deserved. Christ points to the woman and praises her worship, ointment, tears, and so forth. These were all signs of faith and, con and a confession. With Christ she sought forgiveness of sins. It is indeed a great example. Not without reason, this moved Christ to rebuke the Pharisee, who was a wise and honorable man, but not a believer. He charges him with a lack of holiness and admonishes him by the example of the woman. In this way, Christ shows that it is disgraceful for the Pharisee, 
While an unlearned woman believes God, he, a doctor of the law, does not believe. He does not acknowledge the Messiah and does not seek from him forgiveness of sins and salvation. So Christ praises her entire worship. This often happens in the scriptures, that by one word we embrace many things. Below we shall speak at greater length about similar passages such as Luke 11:41, But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. He requires not only alms, but also the righteousness of faith. He says here, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. This means she had truly worshipped me with faith and faith's exercises and signs. He means the entire worship. Meanwhile, he teaches this. Forgiveness of sins is properly received by faith, even though love, confession, and other good fruit ought to follow. He does not mean that these fruit are the price or are the atonement that reconciles us to God because of which the forgiveness of sins is given. All right, so that's a rather lengthy section, and so we'll start doing this. Um, Pastor Bakey, if you would, would you just kind of introduce this Luke 7 stuff, what we're talking about here, uh, what this passage is kind of these these five paragraphs and what it's about. Okay, yeah, this uh, passage begins in Luke chapter 7 with verse 36, uh, in which one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And uh, we hear then, while he is at this uh, dinner, a woman who is known to be a sinner finds out that Jesus is there at the Pharisee's house, and uh, she brings a flask of ointment, and uh, she wets his feet with her tears. Uh, she wipes her uh, his feet with the hair of her head. Uh, she kisses his feet. She anoints his feet with the ointment that she brought. And then we hear the Pharisee's objection uh, that, well, if Jesus were really a prophet, the Pharisee says, uh, if he really knew who this woman was, he would not allow her to touch him. Jesus, knowing all things, knows what he is saying to himself, and so he uh, tells him a parable, uh, a parable of two debtors, one who owes a great amount, 500 denarii, and then a smaller amount, one who only owes 50. Uh, he says in this, uh, in this parable, one, uh, the moneylender cancels the debt of both, and then he asks the Pharisee, who of the two debtors will love the moneylender the most? And then Simon the Pharisee answers, the one who has canceled the larger debt. Uh, and then Jesus then runs through all that this woman had done to show him reverence and, and, and worship. And then we get to the verse that is quoted in the Confessions, her sins which are many are forgiven for she loved much. Excellent, thank you. All right, and so then we have this concept of of using a word for something, and then we use that same word for the cause and effects of that thing. So, so here in this example, Christ is using the word love, uh, but he's also using it to to kind of include the faith that was before it, that faith that did justify her, that then did produce the works of love after that. And of course, uh, that's a that's a technical word in which we call synecdoche and uh, how this works. Uh, Pastor Kuntz, do you want to kind of kind of explain this idea of, of synecdoche a little bit further at all? Yeah, uh, Melanchthon's just using it to say that part of the issue that he's having with his opponents is that they're using the scriptures in uh, sort of a intellectually flat or unsophisticated way. They're not paying attention to the forms of speech that either our Lord or Obviously, uh, St. Paul comes up a lot in the justification discussion. They're just not paying attention to the figures of speech that are used or the context. So you can find them throwing Bible verses around left and right, um, whether in the confutation or elsewhere in these kinds of controversies. But uh, since they don't understand how uh, terms are being used and in what manner and in what context, in this case, synecdoche, uh, they simply don't understand the scriptures. So they're basically just doing the equivalent of like, you know, a word search on Bible Gateway and saying, oh, look how many times Jesus says love, or look where Jesus says love, um, and uh, just kind of throwing things out without understanding Scripture in its own context. Very good. As I'm glad you actually brought in some contemporary examples that this still <laughs> very much, very clearly goes on, and uh, right. people <laughs> right. uh, ignore the grammar, uh, they ignore the 
uh, historical context, the grammatical context, and then, yeah, just these figures of speech that Jesus uses, Paul uses them, all the different ways. And, of course, uh, they don't even understand, you know, how, how you would read Luke rather than Revelation or something like that. I mean, just, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Same kind of confusion prevails today. So here you have this example of this woman, and, and so out of her faith comes forth these acts of love, these works of love, and then, of course, Jesus' great declaration, your faith has saved you, which is, you know, properly put, the interpretation of what just took place, that this, this love came forward from this faith that had already saved her, because this faith had already grasped Christ as the Messiah. Now, Pastor Bakey, when we, when we get into this now, then there's this beautiful section where Melanchthon kind of goes off and he talks about worship. Right? We, we live in a day and age where we have, you know, worship wars, maybe a couple, three or four decades of that now. Uh, you know, traditional, contemporary, all this stuff. Uh, what does this have to add to that discussion about worship? Yeah, we find this at the beginning of paragraph 33 or, or 154 that the woman came with the opinion that forgiveness of sins should be sought in Christ. And this worship is the highest worship of Christ. And, and that is very significant that it's this worship, the opinion that the forgiveness of sins should be sought in Christ. Uh, the highest worship was not uh, weeping and anointing Jesus' feet with her tears and with the uh, alabaster flask of ointment. Uh, her highest worship was not drying Jesus' feet with her hair. Um, the highest worship was that she sought the forgiveness of sins from Christ. And so as we go on a little bit further in that paragraph 33, uh, to seek forgiveness of sins from Jesus is truly to acknowledge the Messiah. Uh, and we read, to think of Christ this way, to worship him this way, again, that is to seek from him the forgiveness of sins, to embrace him this way is truly to believe. And uh, with that phrase, Melanchthon answers the um, misunderstanding that we find at the end of paragraph 32. If anyone denies that this is faith, he does not understand at all what faith is. Well, lest we misunderstand what faith is, again, Melanchthon defines it for us. And that is, again, to think of Christ in this way, to worship him this way, to embrace him this way, is truly to believe. And that is the highest worship. Uh, now, you referenced the worship wars and, and different um, forms of, of liturgy and, and, and worship and, and praise and etc. Um, one must simply ask this. In my words, in my actions, am I confessing that from Christ I am receiving the forgiveness of sins? Or by my words and actions, am I confessing something else? Um, whether that is the forgiveness of sins is received in some other way, perhaps by love, perhaps by piety, perhaps by uh, adherence to the commandments, or by my words and actions, am I confessing something else about Jesus? that he has some other role to play than to be the Messiah, that is, the one who forgives my sins by grace alone. So this would be, I mean, if, you're, if your view of worship is, worship is when I come to church to praise God, that is not as high as someone who comes to church and says, I come to church to receive forgiveness of sins from Jesus. Uh, and and through his means, of course, and then and maybe we want to talk a little bit briefly about the means which Christ has said, you know, I've earned this forgiveness of sins. Now I'm going to deliver it to you through these things. Right. Uh, again, what do you seek from Christ when you come to church on Sunday morning? Do you seek uh, a warm and and fuzzy feeling in your heart? Do you seek happiness and encouragement? We'll have to continue, I suppose, in a little bit. Yeah, we're running up against a hard break here. So, uh, you know what? You want to hear more about worship and receiving the forgiveness of sins? Tune back into Concord Matters after the break. Hi, this is Pastor Mark Azil, the LCMS Director of Campus Ministry and the Chancellor of LCMSU inviting you to join us right here on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. in the Student Union. If you can't make it, Student Union is always available as a podcast at kfuo.org. 
Learn more about LCMSU at lcmsu.org. And remember, college is tough. You need Jesus. We'll help. Wednesday afternoon at 2 on KFUO. KFUO embracing today's technologies to bring the good news message of Christ to the world. Listening to Worldwide KFUO on the go with your smartphone doesn't mean you have to walk around with earbuds all day. You can Bluetooth or sync up to listen in your car while driving anywhere. There are many easy ways to listen to WorldwideKFUO.org. On the air, online, and on demand, the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO. Human trafficking is modern-day slavery, and it happens in our own communities. Victims can be any gender, age, or race. Join the Department of Homeland Security's Blue Campaign to learn how to recognize and report this heinous crime. Visit our website at www.dhs.gov slash blue campaign. That's www.dhs.gov slash blue campaign. Your second look could be their second chance. Want to be actively engaged in meaningful service and put your time and talents into action? Volunteer Connection engages, equips, and empowers individuals to serve the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and its national and international ministries at the International Center. Come join us as together we make known the love of Christ. To learn more about Volunteer Connection, please call 314-996-1629. For years, Baltimore Ravens linebacker Ray Lewis was a controversial figure in the NFL, culminating in a murder indictment in 2000 when two men were killed in a fight after a party. Lewis testified against the others involved, took a lesser plea, and began an intense spiritual renewal. He says turned his life around. February 3rd, 2013, Super Bowl 47, the Baltimore Ravens versus the San Francisco 49ers. The trailing 49ers had four chances to score the go-ahead touchdown from the Ravens' seven-yard line. But Baltimore's defense, led by Ray Lewis, held strong and secured a second Super Bowl title. When Lewis took off his jersey, prominently displayed on his shirt were the words, Psalm 91. And at Psalm 91.16, Lewis often quotes publicly, With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. Welcome back to Concord Matters here on KFUAM Radio, the messenger of the good news and streaming all over the world across the Internet. All right, I have a couple guests with me today. I'm I'm your host this week, Pastor Joshua Shear, Senior Pastor, Our Savior Lutheran Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming, coming to you from the great high plains of the state of Wyoming. Uh, With my guests today, Pastor Marcus Bakey, who's Associate Pastor here at Our Savior Lutheran Church, and then also Pastor Adam Coons, who's Senior Pastor or Pastor at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church, in Lidditz, uh, Pennsylvania, and Pastor of Concordia Lutheran Mission in Anvil, Pennsylvania. Uh, again, we are a call-in show, so phone numbers for that, 800-730-2727 or 314-821-0850. We are just covering the Augsburg, uh, Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 5. We are probably roughly in around paragraphs 33 and going into 34. We left off before the break discussing worship and the highest form of worship of Christ. And Pastor Bakey was just getting into a great idea, and we kind of had to go to a hard break. And uh, I missed my cue, so uh, we had to take that hard break rather hard. So we are back to it. Now, Pastor Bakey, as you were talking about, you were talking about this highest form of worship of Christ is to go seeking the re- re- receiving the forgiveness of sins. And, of course, you were asking the, the good rhetorical question that every Christian should ask, why, why am I going to church? Why am I going to these things? Yeah, so again, this is uh, paragraph... 33 or 154 in the uh, other editions. So the woman came with the opinion that forgiveness of sins should be sought in Christ. This worship is the highest worship of Christ. So when we Christians go to worship, when we go to church on Sunday morning or or whenever it is that we go, uh, we should ask ourselves, why am I going? Am I, first of all, am I going to give something to Jesus or am I going to receive something from Jesus? And if I'm going to receive something from Jesus, what is it that I wish to receive from him? Again, it could be anything from a feeling, 
uh, to uh, material blessings? Or am I going to receive from him what he's promised to give? And that is the forgiveness of sins. And, and the way not only you answer that, but the way that your pastor answers that will uh, inevitably shape worship. Because if your pastor confesses, as the confessions do, that the highest worship of Christ is to receive the forgiveness of sins from him, then your worship will be founded on nothing other than the word and the sacraments, uh, the gospel rightly taught and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution. And and this would be, of course, tied into what Jesus taught and said and spoke and, and, and what we Lutherans always confess. And, of course, for Lutherans, the, the key thing is the pure gospel. That is the good news, uh, that the, the forgiveness of sins is there because Christ has earned it for us as our, as our uh, atoning sacrifice, as, as the complete and, and total once and for all, as the book of Hebrews would call it, sacrifice for our sins. And how we receive the forgiveness of sins, why, how, not by works of love, but by believing by trusting in him but then as we see here you know this wonderful definition of faith here uh to think of christ as the messiah as the one who forgives sins to worship him this way to embrace him this way is truly to believe all right so pastor Kuntz, uh add some more into this discussion because you know what this is a huge topic many christians get this wrong um you know for them you know, church is about traditions, or or maybe church is about, yeah, we've been so blessed by God, so we need to go back and give him thanks, which would be properly a fruit of being forgiven. Yeah. Um, but uh, how does this all put together? I mean, some more good examples of our t- modern day. How does, this, how does this passage apply? Yeah, people dishonor, they continue to dishonor Christ and to dishonor God when they think that God is somehow in need of them. I mean, you have really extreme versions of this. Uh, whether it's name it and claim it theology uh, within kind of the farther reaches of American evangelicalism, where if I name it and I have a powerful prayer or whatever it may be, then God will have to give it to me. Um, You have it within American liberal Protestantism, where uh, they alter God's name and and claim that he has a different nature than he does and uh, that they have power to change him and to change how he's represented to his people. It's all over the place. It's wherever man wants to exalt his own powers and thoughts over God's revelation of who he is in Christ. And so, I mean, it, it continues on today. In Melanchthon's day, it was uh, largely monasticism and the ecclesiastical system of the Roman Church. I think today it's going to come in any variety of ways, just depending on where you live and what the prevalent form of man-exalting theology there is in your area. So, so moving on with this idea, you know, he goes into the last half of paragraph 33 here, Melanchthon does, and he's saying, you know, how Christ is contrasting the worship of the Pharisee and the worship offered by this woman. Now, now superficially, people oftentimes will actually look at liturgical worship, and they'll say that's like the traditional worship of the Pharisees. <laughs> but here, Christ is doing something quite deeper than that. When he's criticizing the Pharisee, he's, he's criticizing the Pharisee for what? He, uh, he's not criticizing the Pharisee for for the the liturgical aspect of it. He's criticizing him for what? Yeah, he's not. He's not. I mean, Jesus himself follows uh, liturgical tradition. Uh, you can see throughout Luke's gospel, especially, he's criticizing the Pharisee for not understanding what it means to worship God truly. That the Pharisee is trying to worship God by bringing something to God rather than believing that the Messiah, whom God has sent, Jesus Christ is uh, a sufficient savior for his sins. So the Pharisee wants to worship God without confession and forgiveness. Uh, That's the problem, not the antiquity or the novelty of how he's doing that. It's it's that he wants to worship Christ without faith in the forgiveness of sins. Right. So so, some modern efforts to create worship atmospheres where it's uplifting or encouraging so that people can leave feeling encouraged and, and uplifted and so forth, that actually fits more in line with the Pharisee, correct? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, anyone anyone who wants to uh, who thinks that God needs something from him, or that um, he basically all he needs from God is just a a boost or a recharge, is missing the gravity of two things that Melanchthon is obsessed with in the Apology, which is uh, the terrified heart that truly knows the severity of God's law and the heart which has been comforted uh, through the preaching of the gospel. 
if law and gospel aren't at the center of your worship, then of course you're going to wander into all kinds of weirdness and erroneous ways, whether it's happy clappy or something else, because you just don't know what the thing's all about. Right, so more than just like any kind of musical preference or anything like that, these worship wars really get down to the gospel. Theology, yeah, theology and theology. The gospel. That's what it's basically that, about, the, which is why um, a certain form of worship didn't come from the church that actually confesses these things, because it couldn't, because our theology doesn't give rise to that kind of worship. It, it has a certain form, and, and that's actually for a reason. It's not an accident. Right, and so the so the revivalist type of worship has to come from revivalist type of theology, which was never meant to be about receiving the forgiveness of sins as much as it was about, you know, getting crowds, getting them excited, um, getting them to quote unquote repent, and then of course getting them to try to live you know sanctified lives of works. I think and, that uh, you know, I think I think in the in the in Melanchthon's time, probably that. The thing that they that they brought to God instead of faith and forgiveness was probably most often ritual and money, which you can see from the beautiful churches that they constructed at great expense. I think Americans probably don't do that. What they want to bring instead of faith and the forgiveness of sins uh, by for Christ's sake is probably their emotions. They believe that if their emotions are extravagant, and great and continuous, that then they are truly worshiping God. And so when those emotions fail, that's also why Americans often despair of Christ when their emotions are not what they used to be or what they ought to be. Yeah, so this is kind of the surprise judgment upon upon that, is that folks just right. despair. They, they, they're they not given the gospel. They, they don't realize that the true worship of Christ involves going and seeking him out for the forgiveness of sins. Right, um, exactly. When you're taught that... Worship is about you going and making sure that God gets His share, and then you can feel good about it. Um, yeah, that's just, you're just going to fall flat. So, right. for those listening in, just I mean, listen into this. I mean, think about this. This is the theology that undermines what we gather as Christians to do. Uh, are we there to receive the forgiveness of sins, or are we there to do something else? Pastor Bakey. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to also add on to that that uh, as my fellow guest is speaking about how our our contemporary uh, American Christians are bringing emotion to worship, uh, that's not what our Lord has in mind when He says love, uh, and that's not what's uh, right. referred here in the Augsburg, Con excuse me, the Apology to the Augsburg Confession when it's talking about love. Uh, here, love is not an emotion or a feeling, uh, but rather we find it uh, defined for us in the middle of paragraph thirty-three. Christ points to the woman and praises her worship ointment tears, and so forth. These were all signs of faith and a confession. Uh, so yes, her sins were forgiven, for she loved much, and we talked about that already, um, not as the cause, but the result. Uh, but the result wasn't an emotion, it wasn't a feeling of love in her heart, but rather um, acts of worship, reverence, uh, by which her faith uh, was signified, we see in the next sentence, and a confession of her faith. Excellent point to make, especially in our day and age where people like to take the word love and make it mean whatever they want it to mean. <laughs> so, exactly. All right, so we move into paragraph 34, and they introduce, you know, they're going to talk greater length later about Luke 11, and uh, then they get back to this, you know, the forgiveness of sins. This means that she truly worshipped me with faith and faith's exercises and signs. And that was Pastor Bakey, what he's talking about there, the, the exercises and signs that come out of faith. And, and there's the fruits, so the entire worship. And so um, then I just want to talk, Pastor Kuntz, real quickly about this. Forgiveness of sins is properly received by faith, faith, even though love, confession, and other good fruit ought to follow. And then, of course, they say also that about uh, the, this, all this other stuff, the virtues and stuff that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Pastor Kuntz, can you, can you kind of just clear, clearly state this again for folks listening in, how the relationship between faith and works is? Yeah. Faith is the faith is the tree. It, it um, it's what grows up, and then it necessarily gives rise to fruit. Necessary not for salvation. Your love and your confession and other good fruit are not your salvation. They're not the ground of your salvation. Um, faith in Christ is um, Christ Himself is. But um, these things naturally follow, and this is what our Lord means when He's talking about a tree that bears good fruit, or um, earlier in Luke's Gospel, when the Baptist demands that they bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
Um, this is not itself repentance and faith, but it is what flows from what must naturally grow out of repentance and faith. And the woman in Luke 7 is adorned with many of these things uh, because she knows how much she has been forgiven. Her faith has saved her. Thank you. All right, let's move on to paragraph 35 and following. Paragraph 35 starts out, We are disputing about a great subject, about Christ's honor, and where good minds may seek for sure and firm consolation. We are disputing whether confidence is to be placed in Christ or in our works. If it is to be placed in our works, the honor of mediator and atoning sacrifice will be withdrawn from Christ. Yet we shall find in God's judgment that this confidence is useless. From this confidence, consciences rush directly into despair. If forgiveness of sins and reconciliation do not happen freely for Christ's sake, but for the sake of our love, no one will have forgiveness of sins. He would only have it when he had fulfilled the entire law, because the law does not justify as long as it can accuse us. Therefore it is clear that we are justified through faith, since justification is reconciliation for Christ's sake. For it is very certain that forgiveness of sins is received through faith alone. So again, emphatically stating here again, closing out the section, that forgiveness is received by faith alone or through faith alone. Um, through being a better word there. That it's, that's how it's received. But we have a few things here first. Uh, you know, first of all, he restates again why this is important. Christ's honor is at stake. But even more than that, so that's the objective thing, subjectively, um, where, where good minds may seek for sure and circum, firm consolation. So, so also what's at stake is not only Christ's honor, but your comfort, your consolation, and your confidence, true confidence, not the fake confidence you're going to talk about in a second. So, so this is why this is a big thing. This is why we're debating it. This is why, you know, if you're in the old numbering system, we're in paragraph 156 of this already, right? This is why, because this is about Christ's honor, and it's about our consolation. And this is for those listening in, that you need to, to hear, hear and realize this about your own church, that uh, all of this stuff about the forgiveness of sins, all of this emphasis on baptism and absolution and the gospel and the Lord's Supper is about getting honor to Christ, certainly, because he is the mediator and atoning sacrifice, but he's also... It's about your consolation as a sinner in this world to know that you have Christ, the Messiah, the one through whom forgiveness of sins comes to us, the one that we believe in and have faith in, and the one we worship by that faith and looking for him for the forgiveness of sins. So again, this is just hugely important for all those listening in uh, to think about as your relationship to your church, to your congregation, uh, because you know those congregations do matter, because those are the very places where you hear the word of God receive the sacraments, because Jesus promised, hey, the forgiveness that I earned at the cross is delivered to you in your time, in your place, in my word and in my sacraments. And so this is just great stuff. Now, again, um, we, we get here that the, we shall find in God's judgment this confidence is useless. So, Pastor Bakey, I think earlier you talked about this despair and pride stuff. Notice, I mean, here, just give a little comment about how even the pride ends in despair. Yeah, uh, that was back in paragraphs uh, 28 and 29, that uh, on the one hand, there's despair. If anyone doubts whether sins are forgiven him, he dishonors Christ. Uh, but we can also err on the side of pride. If anyone thinks that he receives forgiveness of sins because he loves, he dishonors Christ. Um, that's uh, putting uh, great confidence in your works, in your intent, in, in your purity, um, uh, a confidence that will quickly be shown to be false. Uh, so again, back in um, paragraph 29, he will discover in God's judgment that this confidence in his own righteousness is wicked and useless. Uh, that when the sinner stands before the Almighty God, he who judges the living and the dead, we find that our own righteousness, the righteousness of our love, the righteousness of our own efforts and works, is wicked and useless. And, and again, just very plain, crystal clear language there in the Apology. It's useless. And so 
the one who would have pride in his own works will quickly fall into despair or um uh, the language the use there is to plunge into despair again very vivid that from the heights of self-confidence to the depths of despair. And we remember from the small catechism that this is uh, the temptation of the devil and the world and, and our own sinful flesh, that we would be deceived into false belief and despair. Always comes back to the catechism. What a wonderful thing that we uh, teach and learn and confess before the world around us. That's for, for sure. Pastor Kuntz, you want to give a little comment on this section as well, about this confidence, despair, and how this works, and then, of course, how the law does not justify as long as it can accuse us. Yeah, I love how practical this is, because you see this time and again. I certainly see this in my own experience, um, how I have seen people plunge uh, just like this uh, from self-confidence into despair, and so often from self-confidence and especially a focus on the emotion uh, in worship that they give into utter unbelief uh, that confidence in one's works is so closely related to unbelief because it really is unbelief that so often people who have that confidence go directly from being, um, quote, on fire for the Lord into open paganism and great shame and vice. Uh, because that's what they believed all along. They were always unbelievers, so to speak, because they did not worship Christ by faith in the forgiveness of sins. I see this so often that I I can't imagine anything more practical than Melanchthon saying so bracingly. You know, this is all going to be useless. I just want you to know that. Uh, so you need to worship Christ by faith and forgiveness. Um, and because until, until you do, uh, the law will always be nagging you. Uh, unless you believe that Christ became a curse uh, for your sin, the curse of the law will remain over you, um, as it does over all those who don't believe in Christ and what he's done for them. Yeah, so so this is great words, great practical words, as you say, uh, simple words. Uh, yeah. The beauty, of, the beauty of this is, you know, frankly put, as, as you listen today, uh, or as you maybe listen to this as a podcast or an archive or whatever it is, you know what what's happening is across America evangelicalism is just shaking people loose like crazy meaning people are just leaving in droves despairing because the high just can't keep high enough and as any kind of drug uh, so the emotional high and so forth the experience in worship continues to decrease and they got to do something new for the high and eventually they get so sick of it they despair or they've been taught you know that they're just the wonderful righteous folks and they've been they're doing so good and then all of a sudden something happens and they just throws everything into havoc and they're into despair yeah. and so many folks are despairing and yet here it is this this golden gem of the gospel exists in this lutheran church and it's to be confessed before the world and and here it is the very thing that all these folks need to hear uh, that, that, that their ex experience of this pharisaical worship that they've had has torn them into, turned them into despair. They've plunged headlong right into despair because that's where it led them, because their worship wasn't centered around the forgiveness of sins in Jesus. And here we are, the very church that, that has this. And of course, you know, this is a good heads up for pastors, for boards of evangelism, for congregation members, for family, friends, and so forth. And when you, when you hear people despairing. Hey, this is the message we bring. This is what we're all about, the forgiveness of sins, which brings you true, sure confidence and consolation. And so there, there's just nothing better than it. Uh, nothing better, because this, this alone is from heaven. This is God's own words and his own message, his own work. And so, yeah, it, it, it just... It, as you see it, as, as you said, Pastor Kuntz, you know, all the, all the people just despairing and... and the world around us. I mean, it, I, I I talk about it every once in a while that you know, idols are being smashed, and, and some people's idols have been a nation, uh, some people's idols have been political parties, some people's idols have been like social constructs and 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 different societal norms, and all of a sudden they're being smashed in our faces, and so okay, we can despair or we can seek out true and sure consolation, uh, and that of course being the, the consolation of the gospel. And, uh, yeah, just, uh, just how it goes. Um, you know, so, so be bold with this message as we, as we talk amongst our people and amongst our communities. This is, this is great stuff. This is wonderful stuff that we have for people and for everything else. 
All right. Uh, just we're we're gonna we got about four or five minutes left here. Um, let's talk a little bit about this, Pastor Bakey. This idea of um, fulfilling the entire law, but yet the law does not justify as long as it can accuse us. How long can the law accuse us? Uh, so, okay, let's see. You're looking at paragraph uh, 36. 36. Thank you. So he would only have it. Um, that is the confidence that comes from the sake of one's love only when he has fulfilled the entire law, um, because the law does not justify as long as it can accuse us. Um, you know, as long as we are placing our confidence in our own works, um, as long as we are seeking our, our uh, justification according to the law, the law then remains the measuring stick, and, and the measuring stick that cannot be met perfectly. Um, think about our Lord's words in the Sermon on the Mount. You therefore must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Um, so the law will continue to accuse as long as you seek it, your justification according to it. Um, um, but when we then see and receive forgiveness of sins for Jesus' sake, uh, when we are justified through faith alone, then the law is silence. Then the gospel speaks, and the law can no longer accuse us. Excellent. And then, of course, to the to the to that is you know the confidence that comes from from having faith in Christ. Uh, Pastor Coons, we kind of st- skipped over it. Um, just if you would, just briefly, for those who are listening who maybe don't have a really firm grasp of theology, um, this idea of mediator and atoning mm-hmm. sacrifice. Yeah. Um, could you could you just just describe what those are actually referring about when they talk about when we say Christ is mediator or when we say Christ is atoning sacrifice? Sure. And if you don't have a great grasp on this, a good place to look would be, and you referenced it earlier with once for all, would be the letter to the Hebrews where these things are discussed um, at great length. Uh, this is part of Christ's priestly office, and so like uh, the high priest in the Old Testament and as the eternal high priest before the Father, Christ is a mediator. He stands between God and men. Um, we have this word that we use. Uh, we often use it in what we now call conflict resolution, and courts use it to keep lawyers' fees down, but it's somebody who can talk to both parties. So. Christ can represent man to God and represent God to man. He's the one mediator, as uh, Paul said in our epistle lesson on, on Sunday from 1 Timothy 2. So a mediator is somebody who goes between and he intercedes for us with the Father. He is our high priest. He's also, he's both priest, but he's also the sacrifice. And he's a sacrifice for our sins in our place. And he is the one who atones by that sacrifice, meaning that he makes peace with God by the sacrifice that he offered once for all on the cross. So both of these are part of his being our priest, our great high priest. Um, he stands before God for our sake and intercedes for us and prays for us and cares for us, and also that he has made an all-sufficient sacrifice for our sins once for all. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, so you've heard it. This is Christ. It's all about Christ. It's all about what he's done. And then, of course, all about what he gives in his church and what is true worship. That is the worship of faith. That is the seeking out Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. You have been listening to Concord Matters. I would exhort you this Sunday, go and seek out Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He gives it in baptism, in absolution, in the Lord's Supper, in the preaching, in the preaching of the gospel. Go and listen. Go and receive the good gifts that Christ has for you. And, of course, this week, being Ascension Week, you can also, in most parishes, catch a Thursday night service, a wonderful message of the Ascension of our Lord, uh, what it means that He is lifted and now fills all things and is over all and in all and through all and so forth. So, you're listening to Concord Matters. Once again, I've been your host, Pastor Shear. Glad to be with you this week. Blessings on your next.